So I'm going to kick off. Kia ora koto, welcome everybody. Um, so this is the very first day of the Our Zero Waste World Summit and it's the first time that we've run this um, event and um, I think it's a, a sign of the world that we live in that we're doing it this way. Um, but it's awesome to be able to kind of highlight some success stories and, and have a chance to discuss some stuff about what it's like to work in this world. Um, and, and also from a local and global perspective as well. So um, it's really exciting. We've got an international panel today. Um, so yeah, the Zero Waste Network is, is obviously a huge advocate for zero waste. Um, we think it's one of the kind of keys that can unlock a pathway to kind of a sustainable um, future for all of us on Earth. Um, and and this is the second uh, discussion that we've had today. So it's part of a program running from today until Sunday. Um, there is live, um, sorry, there is pre-recorded um, content going up onto the website each day, um, covering off kind of key topics. And, and then there's these, these live sessions. So I'll pop back in at the end of the call and just kind of talk about what's coming up next on the program. Um, but the, the uh, moderator for this evening is our illustrious chairman, Marty Hoffett. So I get the great job of um, introducing him. So I think he's a really good choice for this panel topic, which is really about different parts of um, the waste industry. And, and Marty's got really good experience across lots of those different parts. So he um, currently works um, and runs Waste Watchers Limited, which is a consultancy. Um, and then he's obviously super involved in a whole bunch of um, community sector programs running um, EIRST in, um, who, who run Paper for Trees across New Zealand. Um, and then he works with us at the Zero Waste Network. Um, and he's also part of the uh, Product Stewardship Council as well. Um, and I think the other thing about him is that he has got a really long background in education. So um, I guess you might be missing some local government experience, Marty, but otherwise you've got all the boxes ticked. Um, and you might have, I don't even know. Might, might be another story that you can tell us. So um, I'm gonna hand you over to Marty. He's, he's gonna be your super capable moderator. Um, in terms of, um, for participants, uh, attendees, um, if you have questions about the session, if you've got technical issues, you can direct them to me. You can use the chat to do that. Um, or you can also call me or email me if, if the chat's not working. Um, and we're going to use the um, question and answer function, um, which is in your bottom menu, to ask questions of the moderators. So both Marty and I will be looking at those. But technical issues can come to me directly via the chat. Okay, over to you, Marty. Okay. Ko manga toku manga, ko taranga te moana, no taranga moana aho, ko Marty Hoffer tene. Kia ora koto, welcome everyone and good evening. I'll just quickly thank our sponsors, Auckland Council. Auckland Council has a goal of zero waste to landfill by 2040. Good on you, Auckland. And by recycling, composting food, waste, reusing and repurposing items and preventing waste in the first place. Auckland Council will end up sending less waste to landfill, protect our land and waste nothing. Our other sponsor tonight is uh, Rothbury Insurance Brokers, and they've been in partnership with the Zero Waste Network since 2017 um, with the launch of the Buyers Group. So uh, many of our members have uh, joined. We have about 40 members that have joined Rothbury and are currently saving over $80,000 annual in premiums. So thank you, Rothbury. Envision is a zero waste consultancy supporting the development of community led resource recovery in Aotearoa, New Zealand. And Envision specializes in working with local government, completing scoping studies, feasibility studies, and business case studies, as well as mentoring community led resource recovery organizations. And lastly, I'd like to thank Waste Not Consulting. They've been a big sponsor of the Zero Waste Network for a long time. And uh, They've been at the forefront of providing waste minimization consulting in New Zealand since 1997. So a long time, really. Originally operated by the Waste Not Auckland Charitable Trust, Waste Not Consulting has been employee owned since 2006. And our event is also supported by Zero Waste International, 
the Global Alliance and the Global Alliance for Incinerator Alternatives, Gaia. So thank you, Ziwa and Gaia. Right. Our Zero Waste World Summit, tonight's panel session is titled Creating Change Towards Zero Waste. And I'm really looking forward to the discussion around tonight's session. My name is Marty and I'm the chair of the network as Dorda pointed out. And it's, um, it's a pleasure to be the moderator for this session. So before we begin, I'd like to say thank you, Dorda and uh, Izzy for all your behind the scenes technical work and getting the summit off the ground. And um, thank you for being here tonight for technical support. All right, the transition to a zero waste world is about more than recapturing resources in a circular economy. It's a gateway to a new way of thinking about resources, relationships, community, connectedness, and nature. This session will explore the roles and different parts of different parts of society have in creating change towards zero waste, and look at some of the most significant challenges and opportunities that exist for those working in the zero waste sector today. Now I'd like to introduce the panelists tonight and um, let you know how the session is structured. So we have about 90 minutes. We're gonna go until 8.30 tonight uh, for creating change towards zero waste. This is how we'll structure it. Um, we have four panelists, Jack McQuibbon, Sue Coots, Jonathan Hannon, and James Griffin. I will introduce each panelist and give them up to five minutes um, to, to speak and present. I will then ring my bike bell. Yes. At about the four minute mark, if you're still speaking, which will allow them to wrap up. This should take us to about 7.30. And for the next 30 minutes or so, I'll ask a series of questions to our panelists while the audience, that's you, think about questions you wanna ask. And um, we wanna introduce your questions in the last third of the session tonight. So we'd like to de dedicate that to you and your questions. So you can structure your questions as general questions or specific to any of the panelists. And as Dorda pointed out, please use the Q&A function for questions and the chat for technical issues. Panelists, you're welcome to answer questions by writing in the Q&A box yourself. So if there's a specific question to you, Jonathan, or to you, Sue, um, you can actually just answer it in, in the Q&A box. So let's uh, kick off uh, with introducing Jack McQuibbon. Jack is from Zero Waste Europe. Jack is a young leader working in the field of sustainability and campaigning for, and has been campaigning for several years now. After graduating in international relations from the University of Leicester, Jack has gone, to gone on to design and lead successful advocacy campaigns at the United Nations, European Union and British Parliament levels. Jack leads the Zero Waste Cities program which works with over 400 municipalities who have committed to become zero waste. He helps build and shape the program to best support local level implementation of waste prevention and reduction practices and is designing the Zero Waste Europe Academy to become Europe's go-to platform for resource expertise on designing community focused zero waste strategies. Jack, welcome and we look forward to your presentation. Thanks, Marty. Hi, everyone. Good morning. Uh, Kia ora. I hope everyone can hear me okay um, and can now see my screen. If I present, here we go. Um, so, yes, good morning. I should say um, from here in Brussels, good evening to most of you um, tuning in. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here today. Um, my name is Jack McCribbin. I'm the City's Program Coordinator, as Marty said, at Zero Waste Europe. Uh, based here in Brussels, but um, originally from the UK. And I'm just going to quickly give an overview about who we are, what the a Zero Waste City is in the program, and then look forward to the wider discussion in a bit. So Zero Waste Europe, we are an NGO consisting of local groups. Um, we have 31 members in 24 different countries, inside and outside the European Union today. Uh, being based here in Brussels, we obviously use our position uh, and proximity to the EU to, to advocate and to, to call for ambitious European Union uh, policies regarding waste, circular economy, um, chemicals, of course, different aspects within a zero waste strategy. 
But then more importantly, and what is relevant for my role is that we also mentor and support cities uh, towards a zero waste transition. And we do this uh, via our a network of local members, but then also ourselves to really help design, uh, implement and monitor effective zero waste strategies at the local level. The Zero Waste Europe City Programme uh, so we work with it's just under 400 municipalities now who are who have committed to become zero waste. And this means that they're engaged, they've made firm commitments um, regarding sort of waste reduction goals, uh, prevention strategies, community engagement strategies all around or within a zero waste program across Europe. As I mentioned, we do this via uh, our sort of local and national coordinators who are the go-to um, really sort of players at the local level in these countries on the ground supporting the day-to-day -day design and implementation of these zero waste strategies. Uh, a large chunk of our role here in, in Brussels as Zero Waste Europe is that we model front runners and the best practices. We really want to showcase that you know zero waste is achievable. Um, it's not just this vision of, of the future, it's actually that concrete tangible examples that have been implemented uh, successfully across Europe in a range of contexts and across the world I should say too. And so how do we, uh, a big role of ours is to capture these, to sort of communicate them in the most accessible way, to really sort of showcase how they can be um, replicable in other contexts. And as Marty mentioned, we are building um, this expertise online hub by the Zero Waste Europe Academy, full of resources and content, and webinars and study tours, um, where can, you know, people can go to to really learn whatever starting point they're at in their zero waste journey. So our approach with cities and communities basically comes down to this. And what we ask of a, of a municipality or a council that wants to commit to become zero waste is that at the heart of it is this continuous effort to phase out waste. And so we mean not by burning this or sending it to landfill, but instead creating local systems and supply chains, a little ecosystem to do not generate waste in the first place. Um, so working towards that goal. And it's this continuous effort to improve. I think that's a key part of our philosophy is that whether you are recycling 10% or 80%, there is still room for improvement uh, in terms of the, the volume of waste that is being produced or uh, recycling at the very micro level there. So uh, that commitment to continuously optimize the system sits at the heart of our approach and our philosophy with zero waste cities. And finally, as a sort of very quick summary when we communicate our work at uh, the local level, this is just something that encapsulates the, the benefits that we try and communicate. And of course, um, there are the environmental benefits. So if there is less waste in the air and the soil, um, obviously there's less pollution for the humans, for the environment, um, if you're less greenhouse gas emissions, whether you're that's in landfilling or whether that's through incineration. And of course, looking at the picture more holistically, um, less greenhouse gas emissions, less energy used in the extraction and the production of resources if you are reusing and repairing more. Um, but also increasingly, simply if there is less waste to manage, um, a city can really save costs in terms of the, the waste management system, uh, which can either be saved in sort of taxes for citizens or uh, the money that can be saved can be put back into health, education, other sort of key social programs. Um, and I'm just going to ring my bell there, Jack, if you want to talk <laughs> up in a minute or so. Yes. And final point, we also really try and play on the and sort of build the examples and the evidence bank about how a zero waste approach builds social integration and innovation. It brings together local communities, um, it provides more jobs, that stay within the local economy um, to really help foster a sense of community there. And of course, given the, the events of 2020, um, the fact that a zero waste approach really helps build resilience um, in these local communities whereby they're less prone to, to global shocks, the shorter supply chains and are able to um, yeah, feel the effects less of maybe what is happening around the world. So yeah, I'll end it there and stop sharing my screen and um, look forward to the discussions throughout the rest of this panel. Thank you, Jack. That was that was fantastic. Thank you very much for sharing uh, the Zero Waste Europe perspective. Um, next up tonight, I'd like to um, introduce Sue Coots. Um, Sue is um, 
from the Zero Waste Network, Aotearoa, and has been involved in community enterprise and zero waste um, for, um, well, gee, probably longer than me, but uh, 20 odd to 30 years. I won't say it too much like that. So you probably started when you were five. Um, she fell in with the national and international zero waste crew at the Life After Waste Hui in Raglan in 2003. And since then has been working on different levels, operations, network development, influencing policy and campaigning for change as the need arose. She finished up at Wastebusters in Wanaka as general manager uh, just this year, earlier this year. And um, Sue recently took on a new role, um, uh, external affairs role, working at the Zero, Zero Waste Network Aotearoa NZHQ, that stands for headquarters. Um, her focus is on building the evidence base, the practice tools, and the relationships that will make the Zero Waste Network more effective in helping Aotearoa New Zealand make a just transition to a low waste, low carbon circular economy. She's also a member of the Waste Advisory Board that is for our government and our new incoming Minister for the Environment, which provides advice on the relevant matters to the Minister. So thank you, Sue, if you'd like to um, introduce your talk tonight. Hey, thank you, Marty. I guess that you would have heard at the beginning that I've been involved, involved in all sorts of layers of this world. And when I first became involved in um, zero waste, I was a bit of a frustrated um, sustainability person. And I'd been looking around for a way to get involved in sustainability that was practical and you know, that involved your heart, your head and your mind and, and your body. And so for me, it was really about finding a way of getting um, involved in something practical, being able to think about the theory and the big stories and the big picture, and also being able to um, work in a, at a community level to really make change. So that's why I became involved in Wastebusters in the early days. And it's been a, I guess, a bit of a roller coaster journey on the way. Um, you know, the Zero Waste Network in New Zealand is a network of, it started off as a network of operators. So it was a group of people that had started their own or had become involved in community recycling centers or um, environmental organizations in their own community. And they banded together and started to share information and knowledge and ideas. And that was back in the 1990s. Um, coming into the 2000s when zero waste really became popular in New Zealand and there was a real wave of energy. Um, at, nowadays, there's about 100 members of our network, but in those days, there was maybe four or five real exemplar sites, like the ones that Jack was talking about, you know, communities that have really started to take it all by the horns and get going with um, establishing their own community facilities. They... Um, they were the people who came around the country and spoke to us. And there was also people like Mal Williams and um, people from Scotland, people from Wales, people from England, people from Australia who came over and really started to tell the stories of how communities were connecting with zero waste. And it wasn't something that came to us from the top down, it came to us from the bottom up. And I guess that that's really the way that our network has grown and developed over the years. We have um, you know, started in one, one place in our country, blew on the wind out into a, other parts of the, of, the, um, of the country. And generally it's been about people in certain areas picking up the, um, I guess, you know, picking up the mantle and really pushing um, as hard as they can to establish little businesses or little community enterprises in their area, which they've then grown and grown. You can see around the country, there's some of the older ones like CBEC, which do all sorts of different social enterprises, which spun off from the original waste enterprise. There's places like Wastebusters, where there's a couple of different sites in different towns, and they run a lot of different services for their local area, employing about 50 people and turning over around 3 million. Um, there's places like Extreme Waste in Raglan, where you've got uh, really amazing connections into the social environment around their world with a lot of community organizations and environmental organizations working as a network there to really change the landscape in lots of different ways. Uh, I guess that uh, it's about, you know, we've got around about 100 members, as I said, around the country. Some of those are community 
community recycle centers, like I've described, around about 30 of them. And then the rest are generally, or a large proportion of the rest are involved in behavior change projects of all sorts of different scales. Uh, you know, I guess you think that a lot of these places are in small towns or rural areas and you imagine that the scale is fairly small if you take them as individuals but collectively there's a large amount of material that flows through those sites around about 30,000 tons recovered by um, those um, members in last year about 700 jobs so around 460 full-time equivalents and around 30 million in turnover so on the enterprise side it's reasonably substantial uh, we have, uh, I guess, when you come back to the headquarters, which is where Daughter's based, where I'm based, and as you know, we've actually got four and a half people, so the level of resource at the higher level is very small. Uh, we have, um, in the past, we've really been focused on looking after the members and supporting people that want to start community recycling centres or to get that kind of model going in their town. In the same way that Jack's talking about, you know, zero waste cities, we've had a model of being able to support zero waste communities and work really with the grassroots people on the ground and the councils, trying to get those operations established and running and find a, a revenue model to keep them on the road. Uh, recently, we have really started to expand our organisation a bit. We have um, established a business development arm, which we call localized, and they're involved in doing a lot of that work um, that the members used to do in relationships with one another. We've lifted that up to the national level so that the, um, someone wants to start a new recycle center, instead of them coming to an operator who works on the ground and tapping into them through that channel, they'll go to localized and they'll tap into specialized services. So that's in its infancy. We've just got um, a couple of little projects that we've got going with that, but we're hoping to grow that. We've expanded our communications capability. So we've got a person who works part-time doing comms for the network, looking at internal and external comms, and that's slowly ramping up as well. And then we're looking at, um, we've just, my new role is in advocacy, the advocacy space. So we've got a whole person dedicated to that job. And I guess one of the things that, you know, say looking at Europe or um, even Australia, there's a lot more resources go into that national level type activity. If you look at um, Zero Waste Scotland, $18 million goes from um, Scottish Parliament into Zero Waste Scotland um, each year to support their activities. And then they have a budget of, I think, something like $76 million to um, work on circular economy strategies and initiatives in Scotland. So we're going to need to yeah. wind up here shortly. Yep, that's cool. This one, the last one. 20 seconds. Yep, okay. Yeah, so, so I guess that... For us, it's really about those, it's been about those two main ways that we've engaged. One is well, the bottom up from our um, community recycling centres, which are really one stop shops for zero waste, in the same way that um, Jack's talking about zero waste cities, uh, lots of local services. And then uh, with the behaviour change, we're starting to expand from local behaviour change into that more national uh, policy space and thinking about how we can have an effect there. Thank you. So, look, I, I'm sorry to do that to you. You can just, you can, you, you got the passion, girl, and it's just like trying to <laughs> tell everyone everything you want to tell them in five minutes is you can't do it. But anyway, we, we've got, we still got an hour tonight. We got plenty of time yet. So, thank you, okay. Sue. Um, I want to move on now to um, to our next uh, our panelist tonight, uh, Jonathan Hannon. Um, Jonathan is from the Zero Waste Academy at Massey University. So uh, Jonathan is in Palmerston North and um, he's coordinator of the, of the Academy. His role involves teaching, research supervision, industry and community consultation and, adv and advisory around campus and city sustainability. A recent project outcome of the Zero Waste Academy, which is reported as a case study in relation to the nexus for international zero waste academic collaboration um, initiative. Jonathan, that's quite a mouthful, but I, I'm, I'm going to put a full <laughs> stop there, um, is the Plastic Pollution Challenge, PPC. This is a collaborative community engaged citizen science project involving Massey staff and students. Um, uh, well, I should have pre-read this. Uh, now I'm going to mispronounce this, Jonathan, so maybe you can help me out here. Um, 
is it Rangatani and uh, Manawatu Environment Network, uh, Manawatu, Niwa, Palmerston North City Council, Horizons Regional Council, Land Care Trust, local schools, businesses, and a range of other participants. Structured as a living lab initiative, the PPC project is pioneering an innovative new way to learn about and address the negative impact of plastic pollution on the local waterways and ultimately the global oceans. Jonathan is currently undertaking a PhD um, part-time. Um, I've known Jonathan for 20 years, so I think he's been working on his PhD for 19, <laughs> but he's almost there. No, I'm kidding. But um, yeah, the PhD thing, it must be so hard and juggling that and full-time work in a family. Anyway, um, thank you, Jonathan. And, and we really look forward to having you tonight to uh, contribute to our conversation. You take it away. Thanks, Marty. And um, hi to everybody. Um, my intro is going to be pretty quick. I don't have any slides. I, um, I'm the problem child of the panel. I misinterpreted it. All, all of my slides relate to the six questions we're going to be addressing. Uh, so I'll just give you a very brief introduction. Uh, I've been involved in uh, recycling industry and uh, what became zero waste for about 30 years. I was a, a hands-on <clears throat> recycling contractor um, in Fakatani and then in Masted in my hometown where I ran a recycling contract for a number of years uh, doing general recycling and uh, organic recycling, which is really my passion. And in the middle of that, the Zero Waste New Zealand Trust launched with the support of Stephen Tyndall and the Tyndall Foundation, uh, the Zero Waste Campaign. And that kind of really, I found that really transformative in terms of helping me understand what I was doing, what I was passionate about in terms of a big global context. And so along the way, I ended up um, finishing my contract, uh, studying at university and um, then got this job, which was created in the aftermath of the Zero Waste New Zealand Trust's campaign. And so I've been here at Massey University since 2002. And as, as Marty uh, explained, my role involves a whole lot of different things, but um, the, mostly it's, it's kind of morphed into more of a conventional academic role. Uh, so I'm involved in teaching second year environmental science, third year environmental science, and a postgrad paper called uh, Zero Waste for Sustainability, which is part of the, an option in the Masters of Environmental Management. And um, so you, tonight I'm gonna share a little bit from that uh, research informed perspective, because uh, hopefully a few of my students are plugged into the digital summit and hopefully other students um, uh, around the world are, are looking at this and learning as well. And so, Essentially, for as long as I'm at Massey, um, I'll teach what other people would talk about as waste management. I'll teach it and talk about that through the lens and research about that through the lens of zero waste, which in the course of undertaking a PhD, um, I've become more and more certain is the uh, scientifically and in every other way, a really robust and future-proof and innovative and successful approach to what other people talk about as waste management, which has left us with a legacy of uh, tremendous uh, environmental problems. So uh, that's pretty much me. Um, as I said, I've got a few slides addressed to the questions. I think they're going to be available as a PDF. So there's lots of information in there. And I've got a few talking points, which I'll talk briefly to. And I uh, really want to thank um, Marty and Daughter and the Zero Waste New Zealand Network, which um, just do a fantastic job in New Zealand, carrying the torch of Zero Waste forward over decades. So yeah, it's a real privilege to be here. Thank you. Well, thanks for the plug, Jonathan. <laughs> I'll, I'll send you that box of beer after the, uh, after the session. <laughs> that was worth 20 bucks. Um, now, uh, just keep, a keep an eye on the chat box. Uh, there's, um, there's information in there. And as Jonathan said, he's got slides as well available and a recording of this session and a copy of the PowerPoints will go up uh, onto the Summit website um, after the session. And uh, I would like to now introduce our fourth uh, panelist, James Griffin from the Sustainable Business Network um, in New Zealand. Uh, James leads SBN's work on, to accelerate the circular economy in New Zealand. He has extensive commercial experience, having worked in um, large corporates and owned his own business. Um, his business sustainability journey started many years ago via the coffee industry, where he was involved 
in fair trade. James, welcome tonight, and uh, we look forward to hearing from you. Jura Koto, yeah, great to be here. Thanks for the uh, introduction, uh, Marty. So I will uh, share a screen and um, talk a bit about uh, a bit about uh, SBN and uh, what we've been doing. Hopefully, you can all see um, see my screen. So, uh, the Sustainable Business Network has been around since two thousand and three, and in in summary, we're a we're a, a, a an organisation working with our network of uh, over 500 organizations to drive uh, systems change around um, key areas, uh, one of them being waste. And the thing to, to point out about our uh, network is it's very diverse, although the majority would be businesses, of course, as the name would suggest, the, um, uh, we have, uh, you know, a, a good representation of large corporate members, uh, lots of uh, smaller organisations, SMEs, and in New Zealand, an SME is uh, quite small. Uh, we also have uh, government agencies, councils, and, um, and universities, so quite a, a diverse network. Um, the three areas we focus on to facilitate positive change are around uh, climate action, waste, which we'll be talking about, of course, and water, and looking to regenerate our New Zealand waterways. So we are look, we look at uh, waste from a, a circular uh, economy, through a circular economy lens, and we've been working uh, to accelerate circular economy in New Zealand for six years now. And um, so, the work the research we've done and, and since validated um, has identified this sort of six key uh, leverage points for uh, New Zealand to shift uh, to a more circular economy. Um, some fairly obvious ones there and, and, and no doubt we'll go into, uh, into some of that detail in the discussion. So I'm, I'm not going to spend um, a, a long uh, much time at all going through those at, at the moment only to say that they have shaped um, the, the work uh, to date that, that we've been doing that looks at, at where we can influence so those, um, those points and um, put, put some sort of work together. Um, so we've looked at, um, at, at initially understanding the opportunity to move to a more circular economy. We used Auckland as a as a, as a test case there with some um, qualitative and quantitative research. We've got some positive numbers in terms of uh, uh, the, the dollar amount, but uh, significantly also the carbon saving amount for the city shifting towards a more circular economy. We've looked at uh, particular sectors and done some work uh, in the construction uh, sector, for, ex for example. Uh, we've done, we've, we've focused uh, quite a lot on uh, plastic packaging over the last couple of years, uh, really driven by a, 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 a sort of need for businesses to, to know how to navigate this, um, this landscape. Uh, so that's been a significant focus and taking a circular economy lens uh, to, um, to that approach of um, uh, eliminate, innovate, and uh, circulate the remaining plastic packaging. And we also uh, believe that uh, on a very uh, practical level for businesses, uh, that, that, a, um, that a key tangible starting point for more circular economy approaches is via a product stewardship. And we have a, a product stewardship campaign running where we're looking to um, help and support those businesses starting off on a, on a voluntary, at this stage, a product stewardship journey and support those organizations who are, uh, who are offering a product stewardship um, initiatives. And um, so, uh, yeah, just so, so in terms of the uh, discussion uh, ensuing, you know, my perspective will be, you know, very much coming 
from a broad business base um, and um, uh, be really, I'm really looking forward to it. That's, um, that's what I'm going to say for now, Marty, if that's all right. And that's absolutely and totally all right. Thank you very much, James. Um, I, I think at this time, I'm going to ask Jonathan, if you could just sit, share your screen. I would just want to start with question one. And if you want to just um, pull up your, um, pull up, uh, share, share what you've got on your screen. Um, so basically, we've got about, you know, roughly 30 minutes for questions. And um, I want to give you about one to two minutes each to answer them. So um, first question I'd like to ask tonight is, what kind of institutional systems, level changes, programs, infrastructure, policies are needed to bring about zero waste and at what level? So Jonathan, if you want to talk to that question first, that would be great. Wow, you've prepared a slide. You're really organized. <laughs> it's the only thing I'm organized for. Um, so at the beginning of my uh, PhD journey, which is Marty, uh, quite unflattering, says it's taken quite a long time, which is true. Um, one of the things I wanted to do was uh, research based on academic literature what was said about zero waste by the people that are critical of zero waste and so this is just this slide just captures some of that because um, what I understood was a you know a really practical optimistic successful thing in, New in terms of New Zealand's journey has been um, quite an eventful journey and quite problematic and so this slide just captures what is been said in academic literature about zero waste you know, in terms of criticism. The most acute was a local researcher um, who was based here, which was, this was widely reported uh, in terms that zero waste was a, a chronic failure and doomed for failure, that there was no plan for zero waste and therefore it was sort of a, a completely untenable idea. The thing that I guess I've learned from looking at this, uh, you know, is, is that actually this is uh, point for point and, and you've got to understand that science is uh, evidence-based conversation. Science is not about necessarily right or wrong, although I think as the evidence mounts one way or another, you can move in that direction, but it's an evidence-based conversation. What I'd say, I guess, through my research journey is that uh, there's evidence to say that this is, most of this is completely wrong. And uh, so I guess what I've learned from that in terms of answering the question is what, you know, what platform do we need to um, create in order to enable zero waste to succeed and be is, is to confront some of this misinformation. And the reason this misinformation exists is because of a very deliberate and uh, well-constructed campaign by vested interest groups that oppose change. And, and that that is a, a global phenomena that has been in play since smoking, uh, uh, since climate change, whatever vested interest group that uh, is, feels their business model is impacted. And there's a very strong business model that is involved in making and managing waste. And it's a very strong, it's an 80 year old uh, designed the linear economy has been designed. So there's a lot uh, for me in terms of um, about change is, is actually confronting this misinformation with the truth of zero waste, that it's effective and successful. So that's been one of the key things that um, I've been interested in doing. And, and in terms of um, just looking at this from an academic role or people involved in universities, one of the things that we can, we can do is contribute to um, public good advocacy. And, and I'd like to acknowledge that the photo on the bottom left-hand corner is my colleague, Tracia Farrelly. And so we're both involved along with other people in the New Zealand Product Stewardship Council. And so we seek to speak truth to power, be the critic and conscience of society and, and put out uh, public good based information. So that's one of the opportunities alongside refuting misinformation uh, that uh, I think leads can lead to change. And, and so I've been involved in a range of different publications in terms of e-waste and uh, people who will know zero New Zealand's zero waste story. It's been a pretty rocky journey. And um, then 
uh, and I'll just say that um, one of the things I've been involved in locally is this Palmy Plastic Pollution Challenge, which is a living labs project. And, and I talk about that as a case study in the presentation that I'm involved in. So, yeah, I think that's sort of the, the things that immediately came to mind in terms of thinking about what do we, we need to do uh, to uh, help uh, in terms of our political ecology uh, is refute misinformation uh, speak truth to power and get out good information. Hopefully, um, you know, that's one of the things that, you know, been able to do through my role here at Massey University. And um, yeah, so that's me. I'll Thank unshare you. my screen. Thank you, Jonathan. Thank you very much. And I would uh, add on that slide, there are, there are a whole bunch of documents, which Jonathan has probably spent, well, he probably could have finished his PhD five years ago if he didn't write Unchanging Behavior. Um, because it's a huge document and uh, it's, 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 uh, it's the honest truth. So thank you, Jonathan, and uh, really appreciate those answers. Next, I want to call on Jack. Jack, I'll read the question again. Um, so what are the, what, what kind of institutional systems, level changes, programs, infrastructure policies are needed to bring about zero waste and at what level? Yeah, thanks, Marty. It's a good question. Um, and there's a lot of answers, as yeah. Jonathan has touched upon. Um, but I guess maybe from the political side, I'm just going to name a couple um, that I think are key here at the national level, but then also at the local level. And to start at the, the national level, I think uh, it's the role of decision makers and policy makers to implement uh, a framework that will enable local zero waste to flourish. And so what we mean by this is a framework that uh, incentivizes sort of waste prevention and so high fees that are for the disposal of waste sent to landfill or incineration or other environmentally harmful technologies as well. So that's one policy, um, but then also setting up a broader circular strategy at the national level. And this would include things such as like a the national deposit return scheme, uh, extended producer responsibility, uh, sort of a policy framework whereby uh, the biggest polluters, those companies who continually put non-recyclable materials on the market are responsible for the costs of the, the waste management and the cleanup of this as well. And so eco-modulating the cost of that so that it's not uh, the responsibility of the municipality and therefore it's the, yeah, the polluter pays. Um, ensuring that uh, packaging and sort of recycling recyclable materials put on the, on the market as well, uh, setting goals for that at the national level, I think it is really key. Um, fortunate here in Europe, we have the European Union legislation here that sort of outlines this in terms of um, the volume of, or well, the percentage of recyclable materials should be put back into, into packaging and the volume of packaging which should be able to be recycled as well. Um, so that is key to really help encourage and facilitate a more circular uh, strategy at the national and the regional level here as well and so that very quickly just touched upon those things at the national level that really help facilitate like a broader sort of um, infrastructure that will enable uh, municipalities or local councils authorities um, businesses citizens to really implement zero waste at the local level and we believe local level is key because it needs to be each zero waste plan or strategy needs to be adapted to the context that uh, each community works in right so it differs depending on the economy or the sort of the behaviors the past tradition um, of each area and so at the local level what we see is the basic is sort of ensuring that separate collection at the door uh, door side is 100 percent covered specifically including organics because that has the biggest impact of course um, in terms of reducing the residual waste but then also uh, yeah as we said you know ensuring high quality of recyclers if there's no uh, low levels of contamination um, and then also if there's regular composting done or collection of organic waste you can optimize collection rounds even further because you, there's less of a need to, to pick up residual waste you know, there's less smells in the kitchen basically <laughs> um, and so yeah in, encouraging local in innovation connecting businesses at the local level um, facilitating more like packaging free shops um, that kind of stuff whereby uh, Consumers are encouraged to bring their own um, refillable, reusable containers um, and trying to sort of incentivize economically as well 
uh, waste reduction and prevention. So what we have here are examples of pay your first schemes whereby the uh, sort of waste tax is um, a certain degree is fixed, 60, 70%, and then the rest is variable depending on how low um, or how sort of how much waste you generate, I suppose, and those who generate the most pay more, exactly. So um, those may be a couple of things at the national and at the local level that really help facilitate um, and it would accelerate change towards zero waste in our opinion. Thank you, Jack. Thank you very much. For those of you that have just joined us tonight, you're in the session, Creating Change Towards Zero Waste. We're going till 8.30 tonight. We've got Jack McQuibben and Sue Coots, Jonathan Hannon and James Griffin. And uh, next I'd like um, Sue. Uh, do you want me to read the question again, Sue? No, I'm all good. Uh, I guess I agree with all of the things that have been said already, you know, in terms of the creating a good, strong regulatory framework and having the information that people need to be able to act. Um, from our perspective, I think one of the transformational things we see is business models shifting. And like most of our organizations are using a community enterprise or a social enterprise model, which means that you put business to work for the common good. And in that sense, you're using business as a vehicle to be able to deliver social and environmental outcomes. And, and as some communities, cultural outcomes, it's a very different way of thinking about business than you know the traditional, you know, I think the thing that we need to do is to think about the traditional linear model of um, our economy is very connected to the traditional linear thinking of our businesses and you know we just want to work away doing the job get some profit and that's really all there is to it i think that the business models are really starting to shift in new zealand we've got a bit of an interest starting to build in the idea of social enterprise and we've always had um quite strong sense of community enterprise and other local endeavors which are really focused on having revenue flows that come through your system and that your real focus is on the longer the longer game. You know, you're you're not necessarily trying to um, engage in recycling because you want to be a recycler for your whole life. You understand that if recycling is the answer, then we're totally asking the wrong question. We really want to be able to have um, business models that can adapt and change. And and as as like Jack was talking about, you start to harvest all the different pieces. Um, streams from the from the waste or the different types of materials from the waste stream, your business model can evolve. And if you think about some of the community sector sites that we have around the country now, people have started with the recycling, they've moved out into energy projects, into water projects, into biodiversity projects, into tree planting projects, into job creation, into all sorts of different activities which have spun off the back of a recycling scheme activity, which is really about that community resilience and depth that Jack was talking about. So a project which starts with recycling can shift into the space which is really about reuse and repair and keeping products in life for the longest possible time. And I think that having those business models that can evolve and change over time, having business models which are focused on uh, broader outcomes rather than just straight, you know, want to make a dollar is a really important part of it. And I think what we're seeing is a lot of the businesses that James might work with are starting to want to understand how they can create other impacts rather than just make money. And I, I think that businesses have always done that. They've always had a broad sense of what they could do, but it's becoming much more transparent and thought through and intentional. I, so, I feel so mean when I have to ring that bell, but you know, I, I just have to ring that bell. Uh, That's okay. Dorda, Dorda just makes me. She gave me a run sheet and if I don't stick to it, I'm in big trouble. Okay. James, am I going to read the question to you again for, for, for some of the people that have just joined us or maybe Why not? Yeah, well, just for the audience, you might want to do yeah. that. Sure. I will. So for those of you that have just joined us, my name is Marty Hoffer, chair of the Zero Waste Network, and I'm your moderator and I'm speaking with James. So James, what kind of institutional systems, level changes, programs, infrastructure, policies are needed to bring about zero waste and at what level? What do we need to do, James? Well, just want to acknowledge that that's quite a big question. Uh, mm. So, um, so well done for the other panelists to answer it, answer that so succinctly and well. Um, so, that your answer was particularly resonating with me. Uh, you know about the the, the change in, in sort of recognition of uh, need for a change in business models, and certainly seeing that quite evidently. And uh, for those who, who saw that sort of list of six elements of sort of leverage points. 
uh, that I put up at the beginning, you know, the business model was part of that. Um, but just, I suppose, thinking about this at, at, a, at a quite a high level, and if I could, if I could um, uh, pick, pick one sort of um, really potentially a, a world, you know, a, a worldview um, that, that could really, uh, that's really impactful and needed is uh, to, to make this happen is the need to look at the, the, the issue from a systems level, a whole of systems level. And at the SBN about, uh, you know, well, maybe five, six, five years ago, we started talking about, you know, systems change and the need for that. And, uh, and, and, pe and, and uh, people weren't really ready for that message. They, they didn't really understand what we were talking about. So we had to actually dial that down. And um, what I'm seeing now is uh, a, a real sort of um, live example with regards to businesses and uh, plastic packaging and seeing that for the first time, I'm witnessing uh, people realizing uh, that they are in a systems challenge and that they cannot, um, they, they cannot move forward uh, in the usual way just by using you know, their current suppliers up, up and down the supply chain. They are bashing their heads up against the system and recognizing the need to work uh, collaboratively and across the value chain and across the system in the new ways. Um, and so for me, that is a, a, a key for uh, unlocking uh, what we're trying to do here. And, um, you know, it's, um, uh, you know, someone, I've heard someone talking about this impossible to uh, continue uh, for someone to continue in a linear economy mindset when they start to think in systems. So um, that that would be um, uh, a key point for me. Thank you, James. Thank you very much. I didn't even have to bring out the bell. Two minutes, bang on. I'm 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 being um, I'm I'm being quite quick here, Marty. That's right. I get, <laughs> time is flying by, isn't it? We're sort of. Uh, it always does, James. Now we're getting five minutes left. I'm getting kind of a those questions. A bouncy, springy sort of um, um, noise from your from your um, speaker. So I don't know whether there's something you can do, like put a pillow under your speaker or something like that. But just a just I, a little I bit try. Of a, a vibration. Apologies. No, Apologies. that's okay. That's all right. Okay, let's go to our next question. I want to talk about climate change because it's our biggest challenge at the moment, and um, I want I want uh, Jack uh, to lead off this time. Um, so the question, uh, Jack, is. Um, the question, Jack, is how will zero waste interact with climate change mitigation and adaption and other global challenges such as COVID-19? So there's two questions there. you got COVID, but also um, how, how does zero waste interact with climate change mitigation? Thank you. Yeah, some very light uh, questions <laughs> for the panel yeah. today. So, um, no, it's great. I think it's really, as you say, important and uh, the progress that we've seen over awareness in the past couple of years is fantastic, but there's still uh, a lot to be done to translate this into policy action, I think. And so for us, zero waste sits at the heart of climate change mitigation and adaptation and reducing the, the negative effects that it will have um, in numerous ways. I think first and foremost, um, simply if we look at the end of life, so like dealing with the waste that we generate currently, um, uh, if you're able to sort of separately collect organics much more um, often and compost this, then you're taking the, you're reducing the sort of emissions that emit from landfilling uh, by methane in particular. So that's a huge benefit there. But then also if there's less plastic, if there's less waste being incinerated, and often this is the result of high volumes of plastic materials being found in the, in the residual waste, then that reduces the carbon emissions of uh, waste incineration in particular. But um, incineration as a, as a technology in itself is particularly incompatible with, with um, climate change goals. And this is what we've seen here in the EU, um, increasing awareness by policymakers whereby um, funding for, for waste incineration is no longer seen as a sustainable practice compatible with the circular economy as well. And so uh, for a lot of more industrial industrialized countries here. This means detangling often um, waste 
burning with energy systems as well. So you're not only looking at the way, the volume of waste that we produce, the need for a circular economy, but also you need to look at renewable energy systems and the, de the broader decarbonisation agenda as well. So this is why it's like zero waste. We're not just looking at um, recycling here as a much broader systems thinking uh, question to go back to, to your first one there. And so for us there, you need to reduce the volume of waste. Um, it is obviously produced in the way it's handled. But then broadly, you know, if we're talking about uh, reusing and repairing more and keeping the value of uh, materials in the economy, then this has a huge impact on the, the energy needed to extract, produce, manufacture materials as well. So this is what is key. Um, I think that we continually try to encourage when authorities and governments look at the zero waste plans is they look at the total waste generated in itself and that indicator needs to be dropping down if we want to be working towards a circular economy and therefore um, the needing for less consumption and, and less production and therefore the subsequent effects that this has on our environment, on our biodiversity systems, etc. Um, so the, it's huge, huge topic, lots of interlinkages there, but um, just a couple of ideas maybe to get us going. Thank you, Jack. Thank you very much. Uh, so next, Sue, I want to ask you the same question, um, just to break it down again. How will zero waste interact with interact with climate change mitigation and, and adaption and other global challenges such as COVID-19? Well, the, the way that I see it, um, I totally agree with what Jack's saying. You know, the consumption, the rapid, rapid agrees that, you know, the, or the evidence from rapid that the consumption side of our behavior really is a critical thing to address. And although that's a real elephant in the room, you know, when you talk to business or when you talk to consumers, often they're not really that willing to change their behavior um, around consuming goods. And a lot of the wins are to be made by making things last a little bit longer, you know, making sure those materials that have been extracted go back around again. And I see, uh, you know, sort of engaging with humans around waste or climate change, um, they're two sides of the same coin. People can, when they start to think about uh, climate change, they flip over and they see that um, you know, they really need to have an impact on their consumption. And they start to realize that the big global problems are not unconnected. So they start to understand that they're part of a whole system and that those those big systemic issues are spinning off a lot of symptoms and really waste is a symptom of the way that we make and use products and so I think that people can start to see you know they can start to see whether they look through an energy lens if it's through climate change or a materials lens or a soils lens they are able to see that by put feeding materials back into a, into the economy whether it's technical materials or biological materials that we can really start to make a big difference in the in the way that we are much more productive with the energy and the materials that we have passing through our hands at the moment we've got a real focus on you know productivity of labor and that's been the whole story of the industrial revolution but what we've really got to shift to is that productivity of materials and productivity of energy in our business models and and yeah so such a big question. I'm not going to go into the COVID side of it at all. It's my two minutes. Thank you, Sue. It is your two minutes and well done. Right. Um, so we're talking creating change towards zero waste tonight. And we have Jack McQuiven from Zero Waste Europe. We have Sue Coots from the Zero Waste Network, Jonathan Hannon from the Zero Waste Academy. And we have James Griffin from the Sustainable Business Network. And my name is Marty Hofford and I'm your moderator. And the next question is out to um, uh, uh, Jonathan. And so I don't know whether you want to bring up a slide, Jonathan, but this one is uh, the same question that the others have been asked is, is how will zero waste interact with climate change mitigation and adaptation and other global challenges such as COVID-19? Don't know whether you want to talk to it or bring up a slide. Um, you- uh, yep. I'll bring up a slide. So, um, yeah, I think this is uh, this is really really important in terms of uh, in terms of how I speak, I guess, to the uh, to zero waste in terms of teaching through a university context. Is I, I I'm very clear that we we are facing uh, two very different choices, and these these two slides, either side of uh, of this PowerPoint slide, capture that. One is a very 
dumb, dirty and dark, depressing uh, past potential uh, to where we've got to today versus something that's very innovative and creative and zero waste has been at the forefront of that for decades and the key thing I guess I would encourage people to understand or students in terms of learning about waste management zero waste management is that both of these involve design how we got to today was a very deliberate socio-economic design construct that required mass consumption and mass disposal based on a whole lot of fallacious premises that there was infinite resources and infinite ability to uh, pollute. And if we want to do something different, we need to follow the same idea essentially is design our way out of that. And this, of course, is very controversial. I've mentioned the challenge in from a New Zealand point of view of vested interest groups and the misinformation that's put out about processes for change. And this middle graphic just kind of illustrates some of that polarization. I love this quote uh, from Humes, uh, uh, that waste connects to everything, energy, food, pollution, water, health, politics, climate, trash is nothing less than the ultimate lens of our private lives, our priorities, our failings and our hubris. The interesting thing about the next point in this slide is that we, we, these authors are, are not zero waste authors. These are mainstream conventional waste management commentators uh, talking about the essential role that zero waste or waste has in relation to sustainable development. 2016, a report was published by the um, Global Waste Management Outlook uh, that talked about, I guess, what was where we'd got to today, which was just uh, chronic pollution. And, uh, and they talk about waste being a global environmental health and environmental emergency. And again, that's not the zero wasters. We've been saying that for 20 years, but now the mainstream industry commentators are saying that. And they introduced a, a, a project, an action plan, part of the Global Waste Management Outlook. Interesting enough, it had a 100% goal, which is kind of the inverse of a zero waste goal, if you like, to eliminate collection, burning and open dumps. And they did uh, projections as to the value of that. And that, which is, you need to understand that that's essentially just getting half of the world's population onto the bottom rung of the waste management ladder. Not zero waste, not circular economy or anything else, but just the bottom rung of the waste management ladder. And they estimated that just doing that, achieving that goal would achieve 15 to 25 20% reduction in global greenhouse gas emissions would reduce the 1.3 billion tonnes per year of food waste, which is enough to eliminate food po poverty two times over, would create between 9 and 25 million green jobs. And most interesting, that the cost of inaction was 5 to 10 times the cost of action. Just achieving that would achieve 50% of the UN Sustainable Development Goals in one hit. So this information for me, which coming from mainstream waste commentators, is a real confirmation about the essential role that zero waste in a circular economy plays in terms of uh, addressing climate change and moving towards a more sustainable future for our children. Thank you, Jonathan. And uh, we are getting questions coming through in the Q&A and we're at five minutes past eight now and we're, we're moving along nicely. I just want to give James uh, a, a chance to answer uh, that question we had. So James, talk to us about zero waste and, and climate change. Um, t t talk to us for a couple of minutes about that. Okay, yeah, thanks. So, um, I mean, I, I, I'm, um, I, I'm obviously on, on the end of the, 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 the question. So that gives me the sort of luxury to sort of, uh, hear what everyone else is saying and, and not, not uh, repeat it. So, um, because I sort of, I agree with, with those points made uh, to date, but I suppose my my thoughts are that 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 um, whereas whereas sort of we uh, we understand the interconnectedness, and uh, no doubt a lot of uh, the majority of the people listening today would understand it. The vast majority don't, and I don't think uh, it, you know we've done a fantastic job uh, of, uh, of 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 connecting the two. I think at a high level, um, you know, it's um, it's relatively easy to uh, 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 associate the uh, the benefits uh, of the circular economy and um, and a um, um, you know a, a low carbon future. But from a business perspective, you know it, it, it comes you know who are interested in 
in, in what it means to their business. I, I, I think there's lack of clarity and I don't think that's, uh, I think it's a role of us to um, uh, unlock, unlock that a bit. I mean, we've, um, you know, part of the, you know, we deliberately, of course, included a, a, um, a section on the carbon impacts in our, in our study on the circular economy of Auckland and, um, and um, other studies have obviously done, done, done the same thing. The Ellen MacArthur Foundation came out with, with a, a larger, more well, uh, well, more funded study last year connecting the two. But, um, it, you know, it really, to, to make a difference, we need to know what, it, what it's going to mean on a, on, a, on a more granular level um, uh, and, what it, and how it can influence decisions. And, and we need to get better uh, uh, clarity on uh, uh, assuring uh, businesses that then that there's going to be no unintended consequences of going down one particular route in terms of um, uh, displacing carbon uh, or uh, versus uh, de designing out waste. Um, so um, that that would be my point is that um, high level it's um, there is a there's that connection uh, at, at a specific level we we need it to, to sort of hit the ground really. Thank you James. I'm going to go to the Q&A now, and I've got a question from uh, Matthias. This one's for Jack. Um, uh, Jack, how does composting food and other bio waste have a smaller carbon footprint than the same material rotting in a landfill? There's a good question for you, Jack. Thank you. Yeah, this is it's good. It's going to test my uh, knowledge at 8 a.m. in the morning. So um, thank you for the question, Matthias. And I won't get too technical, it's not sort of in a uh, great deal of expertise, but I think the basic premise is that uh, methane doesn't occur in composting due to the aerobic uh, digester, basically. And so if there's the oxygen that occurs that composting has, basically, in the process means that much less methane is emitted, whereby landfilling sites where much more of an anaerobic um, fermentation of, of organic waste and without oxygen this subsequently then releases a high, high, much higher percentage of methane, which as we know is a sort of, I think it's like 25, 20 times more potent than carbon dioxide as a, as a greenhouse gas as well. So it's more to do with the, the way it's treated um, in particular, but uh, there are sort of new technologies out today, what we in Europe called um, MRBT, so mechanical recovery, where you recycle and then biological treatment. And this is the sort of a re residual waste strategy that we're encouraging Municipalities to adopt, whereby you stabilize um, the, the waste that is sent before landfilling as well, and therefore taking as much as the of the harmful emissions and chemicals out of the waste before it is sent for landfilling. Um, Jonathan, since you've got a background in composting and, and a real particular interest in it, can I ask you the same question? Um, how does composting food and other bio waste have a smaller carbon footprint than the same material rotting in a landfill? Jonathan, if, if you would please. Okay, so Jack answered it very well. They're just two different chemical reactions. Um, in an aerobic decomposition, your outputs or the outputs of that are CO2, heat and water, whereas in anaerobic decomposition, you produce methane because it's, it's uh, decomposing in the absence of oxygen. So, yeah, I mean, the simplest, best thing you can do to get started on a zero waste journey is remove organics and and um, you recycle them to beneficial use. And it, it means that the, um, all of that organic matter can be put back into the uh, into soil systems and can enrich soil systems. And New Zealand has a history of eroding organic matter out of soil systems through our farming practices. And um, yeah, so it's basically a win-win scenario. But um, as I said, Jack answered the question pretty well. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, Sue, I'm going to direct this next question to you from Jesse. Um, do you have any advice uh, for um, sifting through the greenwashing? Uh, as a consumer, I'm trying to make good choices, but hard to feel confident when there's so many brands greenwashing. I don't know who to trust. An example, I just found out recently that the majority of products advertised as biodegradable slash compostable don't live up to their claim. How do I identify what is legitimate versus what is greenwashing? You want to do that one, Sue? 
Yeah, I do. Uh, it's really tricky. What we're in at the moment is a situation where a lot of people are facing the challenge that James talked about earlier, where they have to think about changing their packaging. And there often are not great um, end of life options for different types of material streams at the moment. In New Zealand, you, we know that we can recycle one, um, two and five plastics. We know that we can recycle cardboard and paper. We can compost organic material and food waste. But at the moment, there's very little compostable packaging that can go into um, local municipal streams. Some of it can go into your household composting, but a lot of it won't break down unless it has very specific um, heat and acidity and, you know, time factors. So we're in a quite a complicated landscape at the moment. Uh, my best advice, I guess, if you're trying to think about what to buy is to uh, find a trusted brand, you know, like you look at somebody like EcoStore, they have a whole store worry about the packaging choices that they make and what you can do with them. So they choose the um, part of the value that you get from buying an eco store product is that they've already been through that process, they've thought about it, and they're putting something on the shelf that that problem has been solved for you. So you can have a trusted, you know, do the hard work in the background and then have a trusted brand that you go to. You can have a think about, I guess the, the next thing to do is to look at what your options are for the material at the end of its life. So if you have a really great home composting system, then there are some things that you would might want to put in there in terms of um, biodegradable or compostable packaging, but there's other things that you wouldn't put in there. And really it's just a case by case basis. You need to really be thinking about, um, is it one material? Does it contain plastic? Um, you know, if, if you just have a simple cardboard container, then you can compost it at home, or if it's clean, you can put it into the fiber stream of your recycling, but it's a really challenging space. And I think there's very poor labeling requirements in New Zealand. It's something that we really need to get to have some work done on. And there's some very, um, a, a lot of the claims that people are making, they don't even understand what the claims they're making about their own product are. So if you go to them and say, hey, you know, this is not actually recyclable, they, they may end up being quite surprised. And that's a really challenging situation for the businesses themselves as well as the consumers. Thank you, Sue. James, I, I, I want to ask you the same question simply because you represent businesses. The Sustainable Business Network represents businesses all around New Zealand. And a lot of your businesses are members because you know they're trying to do the right thing, and and some may absolutely some may be yeah. these materials, and uh, so yeah, I'd like to hear your perspective on it, James. I, I think yeah, it, it's it's very similar to 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 Sue's. I think the um with yeah pa the, the packaging landscape for everyone to navigate from customers um, uh, to you know brand owners is 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 a real minefield. And, um, and it's really that I mean, it's only been looked at in any depth uh, uh, in the last two years, really, um, you know, from consumer pressure. Um, and, uh, and so it's, it, it's exposed to that, that, that sort of broken system that has been sort of um, continuing quite uh, happily uh, for the last 60 years. And now suddenly, uh, you know, we realize that on mass that there's a, there's a problem. So uh, what what I what I think we'll be seeing is um, is learnings from uh, other other sectors um, coming into the uh, the packaging space. So let's think about uh, the clo uh, apparel and clothing sector. You know, massive massive uh, environmental um, issues um, and being exposed uh, perhaps prior to packaging. And so what we've seen is a is a is a real uh, push for greater transparency around uh, key issues there. So uh, sort of labour rights, um, uh, the the production uh, methods and uh, materials, and um, and that I believe we will start to see coming through in packaging with the the smarter. Um, not only brands, but but uh, aggregating entities are going to be able to provide customers uh, with with the answer that that, that Jesse's wanting, 
um, uh, but that's going to, you know, that's going to take a bit of time. And I think we're already seeing it coming through, um, uh, you know, an interesting case uh, in, in New Zealand with a, a, a pilot of a, of a new type of um, bottle that is, um, uh, has a whole lot of um, data that is accessible about the um, recyclability and uh, uh, verified origins of the uh, material being accessible um, via a via a sort of on-pack QR code for um, uh, for customers via you know and it's and it's in a in a sort of blockchain environment. So um, uh, I think that's a cue of, of what we're going to see coming through. Technology is going to be uh, increase of transparency is going to force businesses to um, uh, upskill their knowledge and make the right decisions, as well as the infrastructure that will enable um, a theoretically compostable or recyclable packaging um, unit to actually be so because um, you know in theory uh, it is currently but in practice uh, not so much. Thank you James. Uh, I got a question that's come through the chat box and this one's for Jack. Um, um, so this person's interested in um, you reflecting on the role of the EU in influencing local and national policy. So how does the EU influence local and national policy? And um, yeah, that's, that's uh, a, a European sort of question. It's a very complex uh, place where you're from because you know, you've, what have you got a billion people and uh, over and uh, a lot of different views on this. So uh, if you don't mind, Jack, I'd like to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, absolutely. It's a good question. Um, so the European Union, uh, the Commission is the sort of legislative arm. It will propose laws. Um, the European Council, which is made up of member states, will ultimately agree to those. They'll often um, sort of amend those laws and then finally agree to them. And that's when they put into practice. And the Commission is responsible then for the monitoring and following up of these laws. And so whilst they're set at the regional level here in Brussels, um, it often means that many directives, as you call them, uh, allow for national interpretation so that they're embedded, we call transposition, embedded into national laws. And this is where, um, for local level implementation, you have the EU sort of sets the agenda. It will set broad um, goals. For example, we have recycling targets of um, all member states should be recycling at least 50% this year of uh, municipal solid waste. And then it goes up 5% in the next five, 10 and 15 years. So by the end of 2035, the aim is to be recycling 65% um, of residual waste. And so whilst uh, the, that's set in Brussels, it's often national governments who are responsible um, for embedding this within existing national uh, laws, regulations um, and the system there. And then it's the responsibility of local, um, many places, local municipalities who have the competencies for uh, waste management to implement the door-to-door -door collection system or um, implement, sorry, uh, different waste prevention initiatives that we've mentioned here throughout. So um, often local municipalities take their inspiration from Brussels and they use it as sort of a reason to go above and beyond. And this is a key part of our argument is that uh, you can either be forced and told to implement the law or you could get ahead of the curve um, engage the community and design a strategy uh, that goes um, above and beyond this on your own terms. And, that, um, and that's ultimately where we see the, the biggest impact and the biggest success to be um, as well. So the relationship is fluid, shall we say? It's not always clear. Um, in some countries, uh, it is extremely useful to say, you know, this is compliance with the EU regulation. In other countries, given the current political climate, it's less helpful as well. So I think that's also important to factor in um, and maybe particularly potent given that I'm from the UK <laughs> as well. So I don't know. Thank you, Jack. I mean, it's, it's great to hear that there's actually targets for, for, for municipalities or local authorities. We don't have those here. Um, so, you know, isn't that great? 50% and going up by 5% every year. What a great target. That's how you get to zero waste. I've got another uh, question in the uh, Q&A. And uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna uh, direct this one to Jonathan. Um, so uh, Jonathan, 
this is the question. Um, and I don't know whether, you, whether you've got the answer or anyone on the panel does. Is there any material on the horizon other than plastic that fulfills, that, uh, fulfills the need of, Western food package, of, of the Western food packaging industry in the 21st century, uh, increasing the shelf life, hygienic, conforms to regulation, light, cheap, et cetera. Now, just before you answer that, Jonathan, I am gonna get Matthias to um, listen to the recorded uh, session this morning that talked about reusables and, and, and there may be some enlightening uh, information there. But Jonathan, have you got any view on, on a material other than plastic that, that we could use to, to put our food packaging in? Um, actually, I don't know a lot about uh, packaging. I've got a colleague here at Massey and we spoke at the, um, the recent circular economy event in the city, uh, who is a packaging specialist, knows more about that. Um, one of the things I have done uh, was about three or four years ago, we gathered up everything that was sold as biodegradable in the city and actually tested it out in the commercial composting operation in our city. And uh, just this touches on a previous question. Uh, the things that did compost effectively were the things that had international um, the uh, recognised uh, compostable logo, lo logos, uh, so that that's a is a good guideline. One of the key problems is that government in New Zealand is sort of like it's sort of hands off. It's sort of the wild west without any kind of direct leadership. And um, I think there's there's real opportunities for biodegradable plastic to um, replace. Uh, fossil plastic. Um, the challenge, one of the challenges of that is that the organic recycling industry, the organic recycling sector is premised on a very simple idea, um, quality in, quality out. They're not really, don't see themselves as a waste processing um, sector. Uh, they see themselves as sort of um, a value added quality materials processing sector, creating soil amendment. So the idea that you would suddenly that sector would suddenly be retooled in a sense to take a whole lot of waste packaging and do something useful with it. I recycle it as a biological nutrient in terms of the circular economy uh, lingo is kind of hits up against this, real, this sort of on the ground gritty reality that actually that sector wants to take in good quality uh, organic resources and produce high quality uh, composted soil amendment and sell it, you know, at a, at a high quality price. I do think there's managed negotiated ways through that, but it requires government leadership. It requires a science evidence-based approach. Uh, and unfortunately, um, the global plastic packaging industry, this is in the, the, a, a quote from the report by the Alan MacArthur Foundation, they externalize $40 billion of environmental costs per year, which is equivalent to their global profit pool. So they have a very strong vested interest group in um, manipulating public discourse and opposing genuine change until it you know, fits with their profit motive. So I think we've got to understand the reality and have a good you know, look at ourselves in terms of understanding the reality check about this. Uh, and you know, in terms of my research, in terms of plastic pollution in our waterways in the city, it's a very stark reality check in terms of the, the consequence of plastic pollution that's gonna be with us for generations and what we need to do about it. It's a critical question. It's quite a specialized bit of knowledge in terms of uh, the transition to other forms of packaging. But I actually think we need to look back and I have a, a favorite slide that I talk about when I show students, which is from my hometown in Masterton, where the entire municipal waste stream uh, was composted and it was run by Blake Brothers Comp Composting. We can't do that now because our municipal waste stream uh, is full of plastic. So this is sort of the, the guts of this issue around circular economy and zero waste. You can't fudge it. There's nowhere to hide. And we've got to have some honest conversations with ourselves about how we package material. Do we need packaging? And then the vested interest groups whose business model was premised around the status quo and who are reluctant to change. Thank you, Jonathan. Thank you. Um, yeah, interesting. Yeah, when you think about waste uh, or the, what we used to discard, uh, you know, 30, 40, 50 years ago, the plastic wasn't there and you probably could compost it all. So thank you very much for that. Yeah. I've got a question it, from the uh, yeah. chat box. Um, you're listening to Creating Change Towards Zero Waste, and we've got Jack McQuibbon, James Griffin, 
Sue Coots, and Jonathan Hannon. And we're coming down to our last four or five minutes tonight. So thank you for those of you that have joined us. Um, this question I wanna to direct towards Sue. Sue, because you are on the Waste Advisory Board giving the <laughs> government um, advice on how to deal with waste and how to work towards a circular economy. Um, we've had a couple of years of progress in government policy, and we certainly have. We've seen some changes. We've had the uh, micro beads banned. We've had the uh, single use plastic shopping bags banned. We've had uh, an announcement to develop a container return scheme. And then we've had an announcement to um, put uh, regulated product stewardship on uh, six priority products recently. Um, so what, what, what do we need to do? What is this government? So we've got a new government. What, what do we need the government to do next? What, what, is, what is the next thing they need to get started on um, to help us work towards zero waste? Thank you, sir. There's a lot of answers to that. I think there's two things that I would say. One is that um, we have tended to favor technical solutions over social solutions. And when you think about waste, it's really a social problem. It's really about mindset. It's really about people's attitudes, whether you're in business, whether you're in government, whether you're in a community or a whatever operating environment or role you have. So I'd really love to see, you know, James was talking about the lack of understanding that people have about the relationship between the whole system and how things fit together, the story of climate change, how people can actually take part and be part of changing the emissions profile of their own life and other lives. We really haven't got any money going into behavior change strategies. And I would love to see us feed more money into the behavior change side of it than we feed into the technical solutions to problems that you know, we're dealing with that are the result of past decisions. I'd love to see us put some money into um, the uh, sort of the, the uh, Jack was talking about the regulatory framework, you know, what's the what's the operating environment that a consumer can work in? Like um, Jesse was talking about earlier, you go to the supermarket, it's very, very difficult to understand which of the multiple packaging options you've got put on the shelf that you should choose. If you have good regulation or good controls over what people are able to put on the shelf, the, the consumer's job is done. They don't have to think that all through. That's already been done for them. And the, you know, I'd love to see that sense of um, you know, the regulation of the cowboy industry so that we actually have a limited amount of packaging coming onto the shelves that you know, obviously we can't can't do away with plastic yet because we don't have viable alternatives and we do have a massive um, food distribution system that's you know functioning at the moment that depends on plastic for its survival so we I think if we could have uh, simpler ways for consumers to be able to pick what's good you know for them to all the products that are on the shelf to be good so to have some framework for that would be really helpful and I think that the product stewardship um, processes that we're going through now, we really need to have all the stakeholders at the table, everyone across the whole value chain so that we don't have people from one section of the supply and recovery chain making decisions for the other parts, because that results in a lot of difficult situations in the future. Now you can think about, I guess, uh, commingled recycling is the classic example of that, where we used to have goods for separated collections, which meant that there was high value materials coming out. We shifted to commingled systems, which meant we had very low value materials coming out. And that's caused a large number of issues for reprocessors, for consumers, for recyclers, for councils in terms of the viability of those services, as well as the practical recovery of the materials. So yeah, I think those three things, having the product stewardship programs, the whole supply chain involved in the discussion, having really great um, sort of systems wrapped around consumers and businesses so that each individual SME in New Zealand doesn't have to pick a package off the shelf, but that there's some guidance around that. And that um, we really do focus on hearts and minds and changing the way people think because that's the biggest lever that we can pull in the long term. Thank you, Sue. You've been listening to Creating Change Towards Zero Waste with the Zero Waste Network tonight. Um, we're we're going to wrap up shortly, and I'm going to just pass on to Dorta to, to uh, say goodnight and tell you about some of the other upcoming um, uh, presentations that we've got going over the next few days. Remember, everyone, that zero waste is about not creating it in the first place. It's about eliminating the production of waste. Um, it's a policy driver. Zero is the goal. And uh, just, to, just to finish off from me, I wanna, I wanna just say that um, 
It's been a pleasure to, to be the moderator tonight. Thank you, Jonathan Hannon. Thank you, Sue Coots. Thank you, Jack McQuibbon. And thank you, James Griffin. And just uh, one thing I'll finish off with is uh, not my words, but uh, some other famous Canadian. If we can't reuse it, if we can't recycle it, if we can't compost it, we simply shouldn't be making it. Over to you, Dorta. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. And um, for all of you who joined us and asked good questions. Um, yeah, it's been a super valuable conversation. So it's just my job to, to wrap up um, and by telling you about what's happening next on the program. Um, relevant to lots of the questions tonight, um, we have two sessions on organics happening tomorrow. So the first one um, at 8 a.m. New Zealand time is an international um, perspectives um, with um, people from the Zero Waste International Alliance joining us. Uh, and then at uh, 10 a.m. we have a, a New Zealand focused session on organics as well. Um, and then if you're in Wellington, we've got a Waste Free Wellington workshop, um, our Zero Waste Network AGM, which you can join by Zoom as well. And then come and have some drinks and snacks with us if you're in Wellington, that would be awesome um, for our networking drinks. And then on Friday, we've got some um, practical zero waste videos going online and we've got a panel discussion um, on zero waste culture as well as panel discussion, uh, looking at kind of international perspectives on zero waste. And then on Saturday, we just go to no live sessions, but videos on um, examples of zero waste happening around New Zealand. And then on Sunday, we end with um, sessions on zero waste design and um, a, a replay of a panel discussion on an anti incineration discussion. So great to um, have you with us tonight and wonderful if you'll join us over the next few days. Thanks, everybody. I'm going to end the session now.